Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our meeting. It's 6.03, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. It's uh, Wednesday, August 3rd. Roll call. Mary Hernandez present. Roberto Zamora present. Espio Chua present. Nereida Cantu present. Alda Benavides present. Dr. Sainz, I declare a quorum. Thank you. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have anyone signed up for public comments? I don't have any public comments. Okay, we have no one signed up for public comments. We'll move on to uh, item number five, La Jolla ISD. Uh, Discussion of La Jolla ISD implementation of Title IX in athletics. Good afternoon, Madam President, Dr. Benavides, Madam Superintendent, Dr. Science, ladies and gentlemen of the board, administration and community. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we would like to give you uh, our board and community an update on our district's implementation of Title IX. Uh, this past uh, June 23rd, the country celebrated the 50th year anniversary of Title IX. Mr. Uh, Munoz, can I refer all the board members to the booklet? Yes, Pam. Uh, in, in your uh, assigned seats, you do have a, a booklet uh, for your reference. Again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this past June 23rd, our country celebrated the 50th year anniversary of Title IX. Uh, this legislation uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex and educational programs receiving federal financial aid. Uh, district administration would like to share uh, our district's implementation of Title IX and share recommendations that, were, uh, that are being brought up by an independent uh, committee in regards to uh, areas of improvement or concerns. When it comes to Title IX, uh, we do have some laws and statutes that, de uh, that determine uh, the, the implementation of non-discriminatory uh, practices. Title IX specifically uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in educational programs receiving federal financial assistance. Athletics uh, are considered an integral part of the institution's educational program and are therefore covered uh, by Title IX. The law states that no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to the discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now in conjunction, we do also have Title VII. Uh, Title VII is more so towards uh, the staffing or the employment practices. Uh, when it comes to Title VII, uh, the statute reads that no employer having employees subjected to any provisions of the section shall discriminate uh, within any establishment in which such employees are employed between employees on the basis of sex by paying wages to employees in such establishment at a rate less than the rate at which he pays wages to employees of the opposite sex in such establishment for equal work on the jobs of performance of which requires equal skill, effort, or responsibility and which are performed under similar working conditions except for such payment is pursuant to a seniority system, a merit system, a system which measures earnings by quantity or quality of production, or a differential ba based on any other factor other than sex. So again, it's equality, right? And we cannot discriminate or pay one more than the other based on the, their gender. Now, as a district, uh, we are also regulated by UIL uh, policy. Uh, and when it comes to UIL, they do have a non-discriminatory policy in which uh, equal opportunity uh, should be afforded to both boys uh, and girls. Now, our district's implementation of, of Title IX. Uh, first of all, 
uh, we do have policy FB local. Uh, a policy FB local designates or requires that a district designate and authorize the Title IX coordinator for students to coordinate its efforts to comply with Title IX of the Educational Amendments uh, of 1972. Uh, in our district, we have Dr. Magda Villarreal, our Assistant Superintendent of, for Student Services, uh, to coordinate such uh, uh, concerns and the implementation of Title IX. Policy FB also stipulates that our district shall provide necessary services and supports to provide students equal access to educational opportunities. Again, uh, it reads that no person shall be excluded from participation in, denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination by any district that receives federal financial assistance on the basis of any of the following protected characteristics. Uh, sex, race, color, or national origin, disability or relationship or, or association with an individual with a disability or age. Policy FB also uh, stipulates the following when it comes to athletic opportunities. It says that a district that operates or sponsors interclassic or intramural athletics shall provide equal athletic opportunity for members of both sexes. The following factors shall be considered in determining whether a district provides equal athletic opportunities. The very first one, whether the selection of sports and levels of competition effectively accommodate the interests and abilities of members of both uh, genders. Uh, the provision of equipment and supplies, scheduling of games and practice time, travel and per diem allowance, opportunity to receive coaching and academic tutoring, assignment and compensation of coaches and tutors, provision of locker rooms and practice and competitive facilities, provision of medical and training facilities and services, provision of housing and dining facilities and services, and also publicity. So again, it has to be equitable. Now when it comes to employment opportunities, right, our district, uh, based on board policy DAA, uh, states that we as a district are an equal opportunity employer. Now policy D uh, DAA states that it is unlawful uh, for a district to em have employment practices that fail or refuse to hire or discharge an individual because of, of such individuals race, color, or national origin, religion, sex, age, disability, or genetic information. And it also states that our district shall not print or publish any notice or advertisement relating to district employment that indicates any preference for any of those characteristics. Again, uh, characteristics that are based on race, color, religion, sex, disability, or national origin, unless the characteristic is a bona fide occupational qualification. So board policy DIA states that it is an unlawful practice, employment practice, to discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, uh, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, national origin, religion, sex, age, disability, or genetic information. So policy DIA is more in line with the compensation. As a district, we gotta compensate employees uh, regardless of these protected characteristics uh, equally and equitably. Now, uh, the following part of our presentation, we're gonna invite Coach Victor Garza, our athletic director, uh, to uh, review how our district uh, applies uh, both policy and, and statute when it comes to the, the application of Title IX and Title VII. Coach Garza. Good afternoon, Madam President, um, Board of Trustees, Superintendent, Administration, my name is Victor Garza, Athletic Director for, the, uh, for our district. And um, on the following page, um, after the heading of athletics, um, we... It's page 15. Please. Page 15. Um, we have our athletic um, department uh, mission. Um, which reads, the mission of La Jolla ISD athletic program is to provide students with an opportunity to compete successfully in, high, in a high school program while supporting and encouraging students to persevere in the rigorous academic coursework required of each student. La Jolla ISD recognizes the value of athletics and the growth and development of our youth. Sports, like any other extracurricular activity, offer students the opportunities to develop leadership skills and learn the value of good sportsmanship. Um, 
low ISD we, we have been offering and have offered uh, for many years, try to develop the uh, same opportunities both for um, both genders, for, for the boys and for the girls. We at the high school level, we offer 12 sports at the, um, for the boys, 12 for the girls. At the middle schools, we currently offer um, eight sports um, and for the boys and eight sports for the girls. Um, even at that, we will be looking at other opportunities from some of these sports that are offered at the high schools in trying to see how we can catch up, to see how we can offer the opportunities to recruit, uh, to allow the opportunities to learn, allow the opportunities to build the skills required. Some of those, and I'll give you one, um, swimming at the middle school. We have a venue that uh, we need to put a practice in more, that we have swimming, and that's something that'll be coming into place. Certain things happen there, we have to look at the whole picture, look at testing, and how can we fit all these sports all at one time. So that's something that we'll be reviewing and um, offering as soon as we're able to fit it into the, the, um, the calendar. Um, those are the sports that are being offered right now at the high schools, boys, of course, football, girls, volleyball, baseball, softball, cross-country basketball, soccer, track and field, swimming, diving, golf, wrestling, powerlifting, and of course, Special Olympics, boys and girls. Um, and at the middle schools, those are the sports currently that, that we are offering. Um, another initiative that we'll be having, hopefully time uh, allows, is an, initi an initiative to uh, introduce wrestling. Wrestling has been very successful at La Jolla ISD, and it's something that we are planning on leading with the coaches to try to see if we can fit it into the calendar, into the schedule, um, to introduce it to our um, middle schools. Um, policy states, mandates that we provide um, you know, separate toilets, locker rooms, shower facilities on the basis of sex. And so at each high school, we do have two gyms. Uh, Palm Beach High School, we do have a separation because of the pack, but we do have two facilities that we offer uh, for the, the, um, our, our sports. Uh, they are being considered. We will be talking uh, further with our um, operations um, superint assistant superintendent in regards to some of the things that we need. We will be working on and offering the better opportunities or in regards to the facility itself and up and um, Storage areas is something that is big at Pompey High School that we will be working with. But we have the two gyms. We have the baseball field, softball field, the same number of fields, the same number of um, tunnels, football, soccer, track and field, same number of practice field. La Jolla High School uses the stadium as their turf field, as their track, um, so that uh, they, they transport it to La Jolla High School. La Jolla High School, given that we have the early colleges around the area, do have uh, flexibility of having additional gyms additional areas for wrestling, additional areas for the other sports. Our stipend compensation that um, we currently have and has been in place for, for um, you know, uh, several years is equal in, in regards to how head coaches, at, uh, besides a head football coach, all head coaches receive the same stipend, and that would be a $6,500 stipend. All head coaches that coach in year-round sport, golf, swimming, get an $8,000 stipend. Um, the season just a little tiny bit uh, prolonged, and they have that. All JV, all varsity assistants get $3,500, and all um, JV um, get uh, $3,000, and freshmen, JV and freshmen. The days vary between the start and the ending of the season, the time of the year and the calendar, and therefore it is. It was adjusted uh, many years ago in regards to that. And those are the the stipends as as they um, are, are and were approved, and at the middle schools. Um, we also have stipends. There is an athletic coordinator at the middle school that gets 10 days and $2,000. Uh, football coaches get um, $1,800 per sport plus five days. Volleyball gets $1,800 per sport plus five days. Why? Because they come in a little bit earlier to get ready and prepared for the first day of school. Um, 
and any other sport is, is compensated at $1,800, okay? And in order to get those five sports, the ruling there is you must do two additional sports in the fall to qualify for those five sports. And that's closely monitored in both the um, male coaches and the female coaches. Um, along with this, we did have an independent um, committee recommendations. We had some of our coaches get together, and I've met with a few of them and some of the things that kind of have been discussed. I'm going to give them an opportunity uh, to come and present um, the remainder of the slides, um, the presentation in regards to uh, some information that uh, they would like to share uh, with, with the board. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Monica, Coach Monica Flores. I actually teach at J.D. Salinas Middle School, but also represent um, our group, which is spearheading this uh, recommendation and reference also, and um, accordance and working with Mr. Garza, our athletic director, in collaboration always with each other and trying to get to where we are today. In reference to our presentation, According to Women's Sports Foundation, there exists a multitude of research that demonstrates the power of sports and girls' lives. Substantial physical, emotional, and psychological benefits. More likely to graduate from high school, have higher grades, and score higher on standard tests than non-athletes. Improved physical and mental health and instill self-confidence and better self-image. Reduce truancy and dropout rates. Reduce stress and depression. And lower odds of considering suicide. Better time management skills. Less likely to be sexually active and decreased rates of unintended pregnancies. Sorry, my fault. I should be on that one. Current inequity according to Women's Sports Foundation. Despite significant benefits, participation rates for girls fall far behind those of boys. By age 14, girls are dropping out of sports at two times the rate of boys. Research has identified these contributing factors to the following. Decreased quality of experience. Availability of quality trained coaches. Playing times may not be optimal. Equipment is not conducive. Safety and transportation issues, lack of positive role models. Mission statement. The mission of La Jolla ISD athletic program is to provide students with an opportunity to compete successfully in a high school program while supporting and encouraging students to preserve in the rigorous academic coursework required of each student. La Jolla ISD recognizes the value of athletics in the growth and development of our youth. Sports, like other extracurricular activities, offer students the opportunity to develop leadership skills and learn the value of good sportsmanship. 22-22 is calendar year. Our goal is to be fair and appropriate, have fair and appropriate representation to achieve equity and empowerment for girls' athletic programs. Our first objective is we will obtain our goal, our recommendation. We will obtain an assistant athletic coordinator at each representative high school and middle school. Our second goal, our objective would to be we will create a common freshman and girls athletic course without limitations to facility and equipment usage. Goal number three, objective number three, we will incorporate a uniform middle school girls athletic program across the district. Objective four, goal four, we will enhance the facilities and training equipment conducive to girls' sports. Objective number one, assistant athletic coordinator. This individual serves as a mentor and a role model for the overall program, builds autonomy, and works in unison with the department to recruit, retain, and refine the athletic program, helps promote engagement and offset cultural and social barriers that girls experience in sports by using a gender informed approach, supports the holistic development of girls beyond sports, helps build supporting relationship with parents, peer network, school administrators, teachers, and other community partners, assists coordinators with administrative responsibilities, 
or concerns related to girls' athletics, assist with the recruitment of female coaches and provide staff development training, helps facilitate implementation of performance-based programs visit visiting feeder schools throughout the school day. Our objective number one, middle school girls athletic coordinator. Collaborates with high school coordinators to vertically align goals with all high school sports programs. Works in collaboration with middle school boys coordinator. Accountable for improvement of overall middle school girls program, which is a recruitment, retention, and refinement, physical fitness, and performance. Helps build supporting relationships with parents, peer networks, social administrators, teachers, and other community partners. Assist with transition of middle school athletes to high school athletes. Following page. Objective number two. Retention and accountability, which we want to incorporate the freshman athletic period at the high schools. Retention and accountability of all participants. Common goal and purpose. Foster engagement and long-term participation. Develop multi-sports athletes to encourage participation in other sports. The implementation of strength and conditioning to better all programs. Accountability for assessment and improvement of all athletes. Objective number three. Uniform middle schools athletic periods. Implementation performance specific program. Implement, excuse me. Implement a performance specific program. Emphasize on effort and intrinsic motivation. Aligned with high school strength and conditioning programs. Optimize participation for all in-season and off-season athletes. Accountability of assess for assessment, progress, and evaluation. Objective number four. Facilitates and training equipment. Conditioning and weight training equipment that safely accommodates the needs of girls' development. Lighter barbells and dumbbells. Resistant bands. Abductor adductor machines, the Smith machines, locker room, suitable and equivalent in size, equal access and first scheduling to weight room, facility improvement, competitive and practice facilities maintained equally. Resources needed to achieve these goals, professional development, at the district, local, and state level. Coaching handbooks with strategies for recruitment, retention, and involvement and motivation specifically for girls. NFHS handbooks for each sport. Competitive stipends, better representation, and communication. Ensure that the athletic experience stays equitable between boys and girls. And then we go to coordinating stipends. Let me just make sure I'm on the right page. Coordinating stipends. At this time, the middle school, these are the stipends across our neighboring school districts. And if you have more time, you can actually go individually one by one. And um, speaking from our group, and we just at this time wanted it before or recommend that since um, we feel that we're La Jolla, we're the place to be. We're always the, what do you call it? Let me recut this. We've always set the standards. We've always been the role models as far as the district, as far as high paying, the highest paying district and this and that. So we're just asking for a recommendation and our suggestion is to, um, with the core collaboration with Coach Mr. Victor Garza, so you consider this. So hopefully, if not this year, that's our goal. If it cannot done be this year, hopefully by next year, that this may uh, be implemented. I know there'll be phases, and we're, um, we're up for suggestions and any of that with Mr. Garza. Again, everything we do is in collaboration with Mr. Garza. We do have a committee that we do get together and we discuss, and representation right now from two middle schools and two high schools. And so, and we've had meetings with Mr. Garza and our committees and people, um, which is a reference to the coaches that represent the female programs and males too. So these are the coordinating stipends from our neighboring schools. I don't know if you need more time with that. <laughs> the next one is our, the high school stipends from our neighboring school districts. Might be tiny, so <laughs> might be hard to read. 
but those are our neighboring school districts. I know that we are proud products of La Jolla, the ones that actually represent you academically, and we've all been student athletes at one point or another. And I just attended earlier a UAL orientation meeting uh, with our coordinator at Juarez Lincoln. Thank you, sir. And he made a good point that I want to stress. And um, it's true. I ran into three of my ex-athletes who are now coaches. And it was such a pleasure. And it, it, it was awesome to see that they came back to our district and are coaching now at that level, at the high school level. And so the AC, our coordinator at the high school, Mr. Gonzalez, says... What do you think these kids look for? What do you what do you have that they others may not have? And he got it right on the nail. He said, you know what it is? It's the rapport you have with your kids that you built with your kids. We have our kids, for myself speaking in middle school, I have them for sixth, seventh, and eighth. I try to build that rapport with them as a female. And he did state that, you know what? We're parents, we're teachers, we're counselors. We're everything you can think of at the middle school and high school. We listen to their stories and their plights. They become our kids. So we do impact them dramatically and positively. And as you can see, there's three kids that are coming back. But by the same token, um, I was talking to Mr. Munoz earlier and we were talking in general in the group, what is it that, what is it that we can do to retain our coaches, female coaches especially, or females in the female programs because we're depleted. Today I counted maybe ladies a good, maybe 100 gentlemen to maybe 30 females. So, and um, speaking to Coach Garza, we are suggesting and recommending this because what is it that we need to do as a district, as a department, to retain what's the, the three-way train? Coach you wanna help me out? You wanna help me out, Coach Basan? The numbers, and we are going to retain. Come here, coach. She's the high school representation, and I'm the middle school representation. It's okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Claudia Basan, uh, Palm View High School uh, cross country track and field coach. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity and listening uh, to our suggestions. I know this was a late addition, and uh, it's the numbers for the athletic period uh, at both Palmview High School and uh, La Jolla. We couldn't uh, come up with the numbers for what is Lincoln, um, and our biggest concern here is the retention rate. If you look at the first page, uh, these are the numbers for Palmview and La Jolla, girls athletics compared to boys. Uh, and if you look at the total number for the girls, we have 235 girls at Palmview High School. 170 for La Jolla High School. In comparison to the boys' athletics at Palmio High School, 409 to 305 at La Jolla High School. So the participation rate is 43%, or there's a 43% gap between girls and boys at Palmio High School. 45% gap uh, at La Jolla High School. When we look at the retention rate, that's the uh, page, the second page of that, uh, those three extra pages that you received. We have right now, these are the counts for the athletic period for 2022-2023. So at Palm View High School, we have 108 freshmen enrolled. And if these numbers are a reflection of what has happened in the past, uh, you look at the count for the seniors, we have 25 left. The 102 are, this is an actual count of the senior class when they were freshmen. We had 102 kids enrolled uh, four years ago, and now we're left with 25. So the retention rate is at a 23%, or 25%, I'm sorry, for Palm View High School. And for La Jolla ISD, am I looking at the right paper? Okay. For La Jolla ISD is the second page, and I'm only focusing on the girls' numbers right now. For La Jolla High School, I'm sorry, 
Uh, they have 71 freshmen enrolled, total 71 freshmen enrolled. Uh, and then by their senior year, they're at about 23. If we look at the numbers from four years ago, ago again for La Jolla uh, High School, they were at 127. And out of those 127, they only have 23 enrolled this year for the school year 2022-2023. So their retention rate is about 18%. So we are asking for you to consider uh, the recommendations that we're making so we can be held accountable uh, in monitoring these kids. Somehow we're losing them, whether it be to other schools, uh, other programs, kids just not participating. Uh, but we want uh, to make sure that we follow these kids and hopefully improve the retention rate. Thank you. Coach uh, Basan. Um, if I may just uh, add a comment here. I know that, um, and Coach Flores as well, yes, I know that, I know firsthand, not only was an, I an athlete for the district, now I'm a parent of athletes of the district, and I know firsthand, you know, the amount of work and the, the passion that is behind each and every one of you, these coaches. If I look back and I think if I didn't have my athletics, you know, I feel like what would my high school have been like? So when, Ms. Uh, Coach Flores, when you said, that you listen, that you listen to them, and you're their parents sometimes, you know, or uh, they're confident, confident sometimes and stuff. They listen to you too, and that's really important. I, I can't stress the importance of that because, as a parent of athletes, like sometimes they'll listen more to what the coach said than what the parent says because no, my coach said to do it this way or my coach said this. So you play such a vital role in 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 the lives of all our athletes. My question to you all is, I know you listed some contributing factors of, of, the, of, of our, you know, that they, they leave or they don't, you know, we lose these kids, these girls especially. What do you think, I mean, you showed us what research, you know, says, but at our district, what do you think it is that you're there every day, you see it, you've seen the numbers going down, what does it come down to? What, what, what do you feel it is here? What are we lacking? I'll be very brutally honest. I think for La Jolla ISD, speaking as a parent, as a community person, and as a coach, we're competing within ourselves in the district. I'm happy that we ex we have a lot of programs so our kids get to go to, which is the ACE program. You have tutoring and you have robotics. And basically, we're competing with those individuals as well. And how can you compete with uh, basically a $50 stipend an hour, which is your ACE program, versus coaching 1800, where we have the responsibility of having kids. We stay after school every day. We have to account for them. We have games once, sometimes meets or twice a week games, whether it be Thursdays and Saturdays. We have to go in on weekends where that individual who does the ACE program or does tutoring or does robotics doesn't have that. It's not the same responsibility. They have the after school, maybe two hours, and um, they get to go home, you know? And, and speaking of that, like this year, a uh, perfect example, Coach Aldo Guerrero, he coaches at one of our elementaries. I just saw him, and I just heard that we lost him as a coach. He's only coach. He went from coaching three sports to one coach. And I said, hey, what happened? Why did you leave us? And he says, well, I'm doing the SEDA after school for this amount of money. I'm doing tutoring for this amount of money, and I'm doing the ACE for $50 an hour. And I'm pretty math because my dad was a pretty good genius at math, and I did the numbers really quick. So even at $35 an hour times two, which is usually from four to six on middle school, I'm talking for high school, at $70 a day. So if I do it four times, that's 280. If I do it four times out of, the, I mean, four days out of the week, okay, so I'm at 280, then times four, I'm already at 1,120 a week. I mean, excuse me, a month. So if I do it for two months with no responsibility, I send the buses on the, you know, the kids, I give them their, their we provide dinner. I'm blessed for that for our kids because I know my kids and the miles need it. So the responsibility, they take role, they whatever, but not to my extent. Like I got mine, hers. I don't feel so much, I don't feel the pressure at middle school because um, I guess where we gear them and that's where their foundation, I feel for them because that's a win and loss. That's their job. And so mine, like them, I'm trying to get the foundation built up, building blocks to get them into the, you know, funnel them into high school. And so when I'm competing against all these other sports, and I'll give you a perfect example last year, two great kids, I'm asking for them for soccer practice, and my kids are like, oh, she's over there in ACE. What do you mean she's in ACE? Yeah, she's over there, don't you see her? And I said, what do you mean? And she's like, and you know, we're, we're mothers. Oh, it's because she found a boyfriend, and the little boy was also in basketball. He wasn't in practice. So I said, well, where is he? 
Oh, he's over there with her too. Both ways, guess what Coach Flores does? We said they listen to you. I'll be right back. So here goes Coach Flores to the ACE teacher. He said, sorry to bother you. Do you have this student, this student? Yes, ma'am, they're over there. I said, well, ma'am, it's because they belong to me at the athletic. You know, we're in, she's in soccer and he's in basketball at this time. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know that. So that's what we're competing against too. Well, luckily I was blessed enough that the little girl said, oh, she's over there. And I was, she was visible to where I could actually go across and get the little girl and bring the little boy back and say, no, you're over there and you're with me. And so that's, that's what's happening in middle school. In my revival, how happening with her at the high school as well. So how do we, like, how do we fix this? How do we work around it to where we're all competing for the same kids and we're depleted when we came back from COVID? It's been a struggle, ladies and gentlemen, when it's, I mean, we've been depression, suicide. Um, I, this, hit, this past year hit me hard. I had seven kids cutters and I had seven suicides. And I have to leave practice to dedicate myself to that one kid because they're my kids at the end of the day. They're her kids. Those are my kids. And I take that to heart. And I'm not gonna lose a kid. And that takes away from my coaching job, but at the same token, I'm gonna save that kid. And that's what we all go through as coaches. But how do we compete within ourselves in the district with $50, $35, and we're at 1800 And we're a sport in middle school of eight weeks. I can't even compare to what they get and how many weeks they put in, which is you can. I, to answer your question, I, I agree. We're losing kids to other programs, but we're also losing kids because our kids experience, or at least girls, uh, different barriers. You know, we have kids that have to, girls that have to go home, take care of uh, the siblings, uh, kids that have to work. You know, it, so it's, it's, we experience different barriers than up north, but I think even from our neighboring district. So I think we need to come up with, with uh, better transportation. And what I mean by that, sometimes these kids have to stay till 7.30, uh, waiting for buses for other programs to finish or football to finish for them to get this bus. If we have a bus uh, maybe at six o'clock, this will alleviate that problem for some of our kids. Uh, maybe recruitment of, of coaches where they can help out in the morning, have morning sessions uh, for those kids that can't stay after school. So I think, uh, you know, yes, it is, uh, we're losing kids to other programs, but I think a lot has to do, at least with the girls, is that they have those barriers that we need to, we need to find solutions for. Mm -hmm. Are we losing them? Where, where is it the grade that we're losing them the most? Is it the transition from middle school to high school? Or is it once they're in high school? We have, it looks like we have the numbers coming in from middle school. I think that transition can be a little smoother, uh, but we're losing them somewhere between their junior year, by the time their senior year, you see, if you look at the numbers, you know, because we are getting good numbers coming into the freshman year. I just feel that we need to implement something better so we can smooth out that transition and then find some system that helps us uh, retain those kids. And in reference to, that was, I only gave you the $35 for the, say for example, the tutoring or the robotics. And for ACE, it's $50 a day, $50 an hour. So if I do it four times a week, I'm already at 400 times four, that's 1,600 a month. You already covered all my stipend with no responsibilities or our stipends. So the other thing is retention. We have the kids, we make up lists. You, the coach will ask me, as a middle school coach, I will come up with the list send it on the drive so she'll know who these kids are. And I too, I follow my kids. I wanna know where my kids went, where did we lose them? And I'm like, I'll follow, like today I spoke to Ms. Rodriguez and I said, who showed up Who showed up for practice? Give me the pictures so I can then start hitting them myself and say, hey, what's going on? But picking back on what she said, it's true. My kids are, they're working because there's only one parent at the house. They're having to take care of their brothers and sisters, having to go home to help in the household and that's another struggle that, you know, what is it that we're doing? I feel, we feel as a group that if we end up um, implementing this or the recommendation is for female, so at least if she were to come to the middle school, they're gonna know that face. They're gonna know that this lady is gonna be looking for them like Coach Flores looked for those two kids and got him. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you have someone like that looking for them and having accountable for them, she's gonna tell you like, bring us back in three years. Well, this is what happened to her or this and this. We're gonna be able to provide that feedback for you. But right now we don't have anything. And so we're just suggesting, recommending that we have a female coordinator at the middle school and high school so we can work collaboratively with Coach Garza and our middle school coordinators 
because it's not also a gender role. It can be a male or a female applying for that position, whoever has the experience. Mm -hmm. And so we want to work together. We want to feel empowered. The females feel empowered and the male who is, might be in that position to follow our kids and then transition over and have that accountability with her and report with them and so they can stay with us and maybe that'll help like the men do. I think women and young ladies feel more comfortable sometimes coming to talk to us about issues that are female issues and some of us know those being the females and may not feel comfortable talking to a male about it. And there's been situations like I told you, I had a situation last year, first week of school for volleyball, which I had a cutter when I, for whatever reason, ended up going to the dressing room and she had just cut herself, so I had to run to go tell the football coach. And I understand him because he just started practice and he's probably like, are you serious, coach? And so that left him out of practice, that left me out of practice and having to take care of all that. Mm -hmm. And so if it was just me, then I, I'd have to go through my chain of command. He is my chain of command. So I would have to go get him and tell him this was going on and here we go again. And so um, that's all we're asking for, um, for you to hear us out and um, we're here for suggestions or whatever you may feel. Coach Garza, any input from you? Yes, ma'am. I, I have some comments, observations, and questions. Yes, and so, Ms. Flores, are you, are you making a case that there is a relationship between compensation and coach retention in the program? I would say, coming from a female aspect in reference to, I mean, basically working with females, that, um, like I said, we have the parent aspect of it. We talk to them every day, we see them every day, we get to follow them. And maybe with that, having now a coordinator come in, she gets to in, come into the athletic period or just come in the day, they'll get to know that individual and know that she's at the high school. So the relationship would be there. So if there is... A, no, but the okay, question go. is, is there a relationship between compensation and retention of coaches, female coaches? Yes, sir. I, I believe it is because... So if we would look then at other districts like you submitted the salary schedules, we would see that, that that's the case. The retention of coaches? Yes. I, I would uh, fair to say yes. At the, the higher you get paid, the more coaches are going to be willing to, to invest in that, in that profession. I'm, but I'm asking about retaining them within the district, retaining them within the program and keeping them from saying, well, I'm gonna go and coach robotics or be into tutor, et cetera. I, I, I believe, yes. I think the more you pay coaches, the more they're gonna be willing to put in the time because okay, as it is. Then as a result of the retention of coaches, are you also suggesting that we will retain more students in the program? Yes. Okay, because let, let me point you to the data that you yes, shared. Sir. So on the data of the Palmview High School, and, uh, and then the, well, it's Palmview, Palmview and I thought you had the other one, let's see where it's at. And it's La Jolla High School, but either way, would you say that the students move, because you're, you're saying that students, athletes, that we are not retaining them as they move from ninth grade to 12th grade? Correct. Okay, would you say as a coach, that at the freshman level we have more students, and that as they move up from freshman competition, to sophomore, because at freshman you might have more than one team, yes, and then at sophomore competition, but that when you get to the junior level and the senior level, now you're competing with fewer athletes per team. Yes, and thus some of the students are no longer able to stay within the program because they're no longer able to compete at that level of competition. So there may be, there may be some losses and not retaining of student athletes for that reason. But the case that is being made here is that we have fewer athletes in the 12th grade than we have at the 9th grade. But wouldn't that be a reason for those students' numbers not being there and not necessarily because there's no additional compensation or salaries? I feel that there's a correlation because we're losing quality coaches. So we're having to go and recruit uh, individuals that might not have any kind of experience uh, with coaching. No, but I'm talking about now the retention of the student athletes. Because we're, we're trying to say, well, student, we're losing yes. student athletes, but I'm raising the question. At the freshman level, we've got more teams and more students competing because they're just trying out. But as they get older and get to compete at the next level, it's just natural you as a, as a coach say, this one stays and this one can no longer compete at that level. 
I, I agree, but going back to losing quality coaches, uh, the kid might not have the best experience and the best opportunity to success. I, I am with you on, on that part, but I, the matter of how many students will, re, will we be retaining at the senior level is just, I mean, now they're even competing with sophomores and juniors that may be competing at their level. So there are some that just don't make the team. Am I right? Okay, so to say, well, we're not retaining them, we're only keeping 57%. I think that's a pretty good number of freshmen if only 57 out of 100 that started off made it to the, to the teams that compete at the higher levels. Well, more skills are required as they get older. And, and that's, the and that's what I'm trying to say the, here. The competition gets tougher, and so therefore, uh, me, for example, you know, I might not make it all the way to the senior year, but somebody that's more <laughs> athletic, they w I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I ran track as a freshman, and I didn't run track as a, as a senior. You know, so, so uh, it, it just depends. You know, uh, you start... You start realizing, the other thing that I was thinking as I was listening to Dr. Samora speak is that as you grow older, you start to realize what is it that you do like? And then you realize, you know what? I'd rather do this and I'd rather do that, you know? Uh, I do want to thank you for putting it together because I've always been to games and I'm always looking at numbers and I always count kids and I always, whether it's fine arts or whether it's athletics, I feel that we have excellent programs, but sometimes there's very few kids taking advantage. And Dr. Uh, Science can vouch for it, because I've told her, this particular group had this many kids. I'm concerned. I was concerned when I was a superintendent. I'm concerned now as a board member, because we have so much to offer, and sometimes our kids are not. But the points that you're bringing up, the kids having to help, I understand that, because we've always been uh, a district with high poverty and I know the kids have to help and they have to juggle working and they have to, I mean, they have jobs at McDonald's, they work till, you know, 11, 12 at night and then they have to go home and do homework. I mean, I, all that that you've pointed out, all those things are accurate. I mean, they're on target. Um, I wish we had a magic wand to change some of yeah. those factors, but we don't. And, I, and, I, and I'm not, uh, in my comments, it's not to say that the compensation is not needed to be there. I'm just saying, is there a relationship between that now and the retention? And then when we look at retention, aren't we our own in terms of coaching, uh, working then against us? Because I mean, we don't keep everybody right. as they progress, right? Well, so then, then I, I just want to keep the two separate. The compensation, I think that we got to have that equity and all of that that mm -hmm. needs to come with it. But I, I think then the retention of the students, that's something different. And there's in terms different of how we do that. That contribute to the retention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the coaches have a lot to do. I am like you. I mean, I had coaches that, that for me, had, not, had it not been for athletics, um, I mean, I don't know where I would, have, mm -hmm. would be because I, I enjoyed athletics. I stayed in, mm -hmm. in athletics uh, uh, more of all my life. Now, but now I only watch them <laughs> as is best I can do. Yeah. Well, I, too, want to commend all of you because this, this plan is very well written, number one, and without the plan, there's no vision. And now that we have a vision, now we need to take the next steps. And it's not, the first steps are, we're listening and we're speaking and we're communicating with each other. Now, the next step is what is going to be our next step, right? And it's good that we communicate because with questions, we, we bring solutions. And what I'm hearing is one, we need female representation, which we've had those conversations even in the past. Two, we need a tracking of why is it that we're not sustaining our students? And then three, we need to continue building those relationships in our athletic program, not only coach to student, but even from coach to coach, and from coach to administrator, that supports our coaches overall, that will also support our students so our athletic program can grow. And I too have attended some uh, female uh, games where I do see very few of our students, and I can see where perhaps as a freshman team, 
we have some freshmen or sophomore uh, players playing at the varsity level and then the dynamics can create, you know, sometimes some hairy situations, right? And with there being more students, there's more opportunities for our students to, to represent us in our district. And so I see that. And now all of us coming together is, what is it that we're going to do to support all of you? So thank you. And thank you for always so, being there for our students in and out of the court. Thank you. Because we want to be just as proud as you are when we see you compete, our athletes compete, and that we come out on top. So, you know, that we want to be winners in everything that we do. So that's, uh, thank you for all the, the work that you do. Thank you, thank you so much. This information is something that uh, we thank you for. It's something that we're gonna look into it, okay? We really appreciate the, the time that you have taken into doing, putting all of this together. And uh, like I said, we're, we should be you know, getting together and, and see what we can do to actually better the, the program. And I wanna really thank you because you guys take the, the students, you know, like they're your own kids, which that is very nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Really quickly, hello, I'm Carissa uh, Garcia Glass. I represent the middle school. I'm at Memorial Middle School. I've been there for going on eight years this year. Um, going back to Dr. Zamora's uh, question and how can we retain those kids at the high school level? Just with the conversations that we've had uh, with Coach Garza, um, going back to one of the slides, that's why we talked about that freshman athletic class. Um, how can we retain these kids from freshman all the way to the, their senior year? And I agree with you, Mr. Dr. Zamora, um, when you get to the varsity level, yes, it's a tryout and not everybody can make it. Um, so freshmen, you do see the numbers high and you do see that a decline as the years go by. Um, with that athletic, freshman athletic class, if a student does not feel or fit that one specific sport, I feel, we feel, that's why we would have that athletic coordinator say, hey, before you leave the athletic program and you give up on that one sport because you feel it didn't help you or you didn't like it, let's try another sport. You know, and it, it, it has happened to where a student has started at one sport, but right now they're excelling at a different sport. And I think, I feel that that can help with retention I feel that that can at least bring it up half, that number up half, and it would be at a different sport. Um, just going back to that yeah, question. And, and to add what you're saying, and I don't know, I, I've been looking at the responsibilities for the coordinator, but I think every coach ought to take it on, and that is, we have as a goal, you know, the, the academics. How are they doing, these students doing academically? How are they doing with attendance? How, what's their social, emotional, uh, situation and providing within that that course within that time period opportunities for that kind of a discussion so that that can be given attention and that students who fail they can't play so some of them may not be playing because they are not making the grade I agree. if they're not attending school they're not going to be learning so we've got to pay attention to those so that we would encourage you then to work with everyone else on staff to ensure that that occurs. I agree, I, I completely agree. Academics is very important. Um, again, yes, a, a head coaches are responsible for, for that as well. Um, and I thank you for asking that question. Because you still have a no personal play, right? Yes, sir, yes, sir, <laughs> yes, sir. And I feel if we, if before giving up on that student, before they leave, we would exhaust all, all, all needs at that point. So, thank you for thank your you. comments. Appreciate it. Thank you, coaches. Um, I also want to thank you for, well, for your commitment and the passion that you serve our kids. And I think that we can all agree that we all want the very best athletic programs for our kids. And so I hope that we can continue to talk and plan and make whatever improvements we can so that every student benefits from an exceptional athletic program. So thank you so much, coaches. 
Dr. Sainz, if I may, um, October 5th, 21, this past year, based on a conversation that we had, that we, had um, we developed athletic priorities and athletic areas of need, that for the players, that for the professional staff, and that for the athletic office ourselves. We've reevaluated ourselves. And one of the, the, the main topics that Dr. Smota and, and we've been talking about is learning to work together in sharing athletes at times is also a big critical factor that we need to take into consideration. And not just about athletics. I talked to the guys on, on your behalf and I congratulated them on your behalf today, UIL orientation. I said, we're losing them maybe to fine arts. We're losing them somewhere else. They go dance, that's okay. But let's invite them to the big dance. Let's invite them to the Friday night games and let them be a part of athletics also that we can share. It's coming up with innovative ideas and that's what we're working on, and we have these priorities that we'll continue to explore and, and work on and, and share with the, the, the coaches. This has been very, very productive meetings that I had with them, and, and they're going to continue. Thank yeah, you for the opportunity. Good. Thank you for sharing you, that, Coach, Coach, because it is about providing many varied experiences for our kids, especially in the middle school and freshman and maybe sophomore years. And, letting them experience as many things, whether it's UIL academics, whether it's fine arts or athletics, and letting them experience, and then maybe they can pick one, but it should not be the adults in the district that prohibit a student from participating in one and maybe not in another. So thank you for looking at, at solutions so that we can make sure that if students want to participate in different programs, that we as the adults do not put barriers, for example, practice times and transportation schedules. Those are the things that, I, that we need to continue to work on. Thank you. We do, of course, want to thank uh, our coaches that came in today and shared their recommendations. Uh, Coach Monica Flores from J.D. Salinas, Coach Carissa Garcia from Memorial Middle School, Coach Claudia Bassan from Palm Beach High School, and Coach Chris Hernandez from La Jolla High School. Um, we are a district of choice and opportunities, right? We do offer students a platform to shine, whether it's in the athletic field, in the fine arts, or in the classroom. Uh, hence the reason why we see a decline in participation, because we offer a lot. But we do thank our coaches for the recommendations uh, and suggestions. Uh, we will be meeting with the administratively uh, to see what are some of the things that we and adjustments we can make to uh, put into practice some of the recommendations. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, your guidance and support. Uh, we will, if, if needed, we will come back later on to, to present on some of those adjustments that we have made. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your um, comments. Just, just to reinforce, I heard that we're in compliance with Title IX. Yes. Yes. Okay. Just to make Thank sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Samora. Yeah, just to let yes. everybody know, we are in compliance with Title IX. Which is... yeah. okay. On uh, number uh, six, we'll move on to the next item, discussion and presentation of State Fire Mar Marshal consultation visit. Mr. Lloyd Loya, our energy manager. Uh, management Director is going to take care of this presentation. Welcome, Good afternoon, Mr. Loya. Madam Board President, Board of Trustees, uh, our cabinet, and of course the community that's tuned into our work session. I'm Lloyd Loya. I am the Energy, Utilities, and Compliance Director for the school district, and I'm here to update the board on our recent uh, fire, uh, fire marshal inspection. Um, so by law, every year we are required to have a fire marshal inspection. This is nothing new. Just wanted to throw that out there. Um, these inspections occur during uh, the, the summer months. Uh, we do this uh, for the simple fact that we don't want to interrupt instruction and the fire marshals are able to go into any room they please, any storage room. I know during the year we have testing materials where we can't go in, so that's why we encourage them to come in the summer. Um, so usually our local fire marshals conduct these inspections. Uh, however, uh, this year we were selected to have a state fire marshal inspection which uh, for us, we were grateful, we were thankful. Uh, we get the best of both worlds. Um, our local fire marshals operate under the uh, IF, IFC code, which is a uh, international fire code, and our state fire marshals operate under the NFPA uh, code. So this way we're in compliance with both the state level and our local fire marshals. 
Um, so they came in the first two weeks of June. We welcomed them in. We opened up our doors to them. We showed we had nothing to hide. We let them, uh, they asked questions. They went into mechanical rooms, storage rooms, electrical rooms, um, you name it. Uh, they, it was a, 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 a full uh, consultation, a full inspection. Um, so not only did they educate my, myself and my staff on on a fire safety rules and fire system requirements, but they also educated us and gave us recommendations on how to, how to tighten up our security measures. Unfortunately, we live in a world where events like Uvalde happen. So this was something great for us, something that we got a different perspective from a, from a different agency. And they showed us um, a lot of, uh, like I said, a lot of recommendations, a lot of tips where we can tighten up things that, 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 that we can do to uh, of course, you can't restrict people from getting out, but you can restrict people from, from coming into the campus. So they uh, gave us a lot of those recommendations. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about how we broke down the, the inspection. So three marshals came down. Uh, I, I myself escorted one of the marshals. One of my compliance uh, employees escorted the second marshal, and one of my energy employees escorted the third marshal. So, we were walking three schools at, at, at once. At, at once. Um, we were extremely proactive. And what I mean by that is, I would walk with a marshal. Behind me, I had a director from physical plant with a crew of plumbers, a crew of uh, electricians, a crew of AC techs, and construction. And we did that for the simple fact that any time a marshal would call out a violation, I had the crew back here. I would hand them a note. And hallway E, you need to fix these things. So. I'll give you an example. At a campus, maybe we had 25 violations. By the time they were done, we had already fixed 20 of them. So for, for the most part, there were common wear and tear items that occurred during a full, normal school year like the one we just had. Uh, ceiling tiles, and I'll go over the, the, the most common violations, the reoccurring violations uh, that, that occurred. Uh, but those wear and tear items, we're already addressing in, in the summer anyways. Our operations department they do an awesome job, custodial transportation, uh, CNS department, of course, physical plant, my compliance and energy uh, team. So uh, they came during the months where it's our show time. It's when everyone's at home, we, we get to work. That's how we get the schools ready for the first day of, of, uh, of, of school. Um, I'm gonna go over a few common um, violations. That way when we get to the reports, you know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna show you some photos. Okay, so the first one on my list will be um, uh, occupancy load times. So when you go to a restaurant or any building out there in public, what do you see when you walk into the door? Uh, maximum occupancy load. So that's something that's what is gonna be called out in every single campus, uh, in our gyms, in our libraries, and in our cafeterias. Since it's a place of assembly, we need to, they're requiring for us to have a, a, um, a, uh, a sign that, that gives us the amount of people who can be in there. So I have my staff out there taking square footage, they did give us a, a formula where we're gonna input the, the, the square footage and they'll let us know uh, the, 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 the number of people that, that can be inside that space. So you will see um, that, that violation in all our campuses. That's something that's it's an easy fix. We'll just post up the number and, and we'll be good to go on that. Um, evacuation diagram. We did really good. Uh, all our campuses had evacuation diagrams in their in their uh, in their classrooms, so let me get that for you. Here we go. I'm going to show you an example of a of a school. So all our camp all our classrooms had an evacuation diagram before you walked out, and and that was really good. Uh, unfortunately, what, what they want for us to do is add this "you are here" start to it. So when you're at the mall, when you're at an outlet and you see the, the, the diagram of, of, of the place you're at, it says you are here, how do I get to Foot Locker? How do I get to uh, a store there at the outlet? Same concept. This is Clinton Elementary. Uh, the marshal wanted for me to, to show this example, and I thank uh, the, the staff for allowing me to, to, uh, to present to the board. Um, if, if you can see here, this is classroom 214 with a star. So every single classroom should have a different diagram, depending where they're at. Um, a primary exit, is the blue line, a secondary exit would be the red line. And then this campus went above and beyond and also identified where all their fire extinguishers are at. So if you look around the entire diagram map, you'll see where all their fire extinguishers are at. So that's something that, that, that we're gonna implement and, and that's, it's, it's not a, 
a big violation, we'll go ahead and, and, and address that. Um, Mr. Loya, and I'm just curious. Go ahead. That wasn't required before? Yes, it's required. So we have them in, in all our um, classrooms, but they, they want us to put that star that, that uh, you That's are here. That's the new part. Right, I'm just saying, and then that wasn't required before? Um, like I said, we had never been called out on that, ma'am. That's the first time that we have been called out in on, our previous on something. Inspections, our previous inspections. That had never been a finding. So that, that's what I mean that we get the best of both worlds. We were getting our local fire marshals. Now we're getting our state fire marshals. So it's a little bit more uh, precise. A, 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 a more, how can I say it? Uh, the uh, state fire marshals are exactly. a little stricter. They, 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 exactly. They're, they're a little bit stricter. Their, their requirements. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Yeah, that's really good because I mean that's I think that's like super needed. <laughs> Even when it says you're here, you're kind of lost anyway. So yes, ma'am. It, it's a big help. I'm just surprised it wasn't required because it's here to find where you're at. So I'm glad yes, we added that. So we're gonna take care of that this year. We're gonna implement that. Um, after our, our inspection, we got together. And what I, what I, when I say we is our operations department, and we created a checklist. Um, and we uh, got together with Dr. Magda Verag and she sent it out to our principals. So uh, next week when our staff gets back, they will be going over this inspection. I mean, this uh, school fire safety checklist. So basically these are all the violations that, that we kind of got called out on. So uh, like I said, next week they will be uh, uh, talking about what you can and what you cannot have in your classrooms, in your hallways. Uh, and in your campus, and we will be enforcing um, uh, these uh, th this checklist throughout the year. Who's in charge of implementation of these of this checklist? Like, for example, in the district level, is it yourself? It's, and in the campus level? So, on the campus level, we're 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 gonna have the administration. Uh, I mean, we're in charge of it to 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 walk our campuses. But I have three techs for the entire district. We can't be in every campus. So we're asking our administration staff at our campus to help us out just to enforce. We are going to do our walkthroughs. We are going to uh, call them out and we'll, we'll meet with the principals to let them know if, if, they're, if, they're, if any of these things are, are, are being, uh, are, 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 they're, they're not in compliance. But at the campus, it is the principal that's yes. always been in charge of any safety procedures to be implemented. Yeah, safety okay. committee. And it will continue to be. So, so after they're corrected, do we like do they come back or do we just send like yes so i i'll, I'll get that i'll get to that in my presentation but yes uh, uh mr hernandez um so we're gonna send them an update of how of uh, of what we're where we're fixing uh, every month uh the next one on my list is exit lighting log so for the most part our 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 staff goes out there and they test our exit lights to make sure that if the power goes off they stay on We've, we all, we've always done that, but now they're requiring for us to have a log. So at each campus, we'll have the, the campus name, the employee who, who was doing the testing, what time he was there, and of course the year. That way we'll have a copy in our office and the, and the campus will have one in the safety binder in the front office. So that's something we're gonna implement as well. Um, wall decor, that's, uh, that's something that excessive wall decor. And I know it's hard. Um, we're used to filling up our, our hallways and our classrooms with artwork, which is beautiful. I, I mean, my kids attend La Jolla SD. When I, when I go to a open house, I love to see my, 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 my kids work on the wall, uh, but we need to be safe about it. So um, I uploaded uh, an example. These are not our schools. This is an example that the marshal gave to me. So these two are acceptable. You see how it's, it's nice and neat, it's not like, too excessive. The, the ones, the two on the bottom, we can't cover up our doors, we can't hang anything from our ceiling tiles, and we can't, yeah. uh, it, it's just, it's a, it's a fire hazard. Yeah. And I know it's hard, so it's gonna be kind of hard to, to change yeah. our, our, trees, uh, yeah. our... Academic walls. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's what we need. Um, not so Martha Stewart me, yeah, classrooms. Me, Mr. Loya, let me just say that the things that Mr. Loya is reviewing right now were common um, throughout. Yes, and before he goes into an actual campus report, we wanted to tell you like the 10 most common violations. Uh, violations. That we were caught out. And so this is the third one, I believe. The, yeah, we're in the third or fourth one. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, so just to make it clear, uh, some of our schools were built in, in the 70s or the 80s. So they were in a different uh, uh, compliance codes. So some don't have a riser room or sprinkler system. Of course, they do have fire extinguishers and their smoke detectors. 
Um, so those are a little different. If, you, if your campus has a, a, a riser room, a sprinkler system, you're allowed to have 50% of your wall covered. If you only have uh, fire extinguishers and, and smoke detectors, you're allowed to have 20% of your wall covered. So that's something that we're going to go out there and start enforcing. The oh, next one is... Uh, so Mr. Lara, yes, the sir. schools that do not have a sprinkler system, because I was interested in the, 70, uh, the 70s and 80s, so are we looking at the two-story facilities? Yes, that we sir. Have? Yes, sir. But, 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 but those are in compliance. Uh, they do have all the required uh, smoke detectors and their fire extinguishers. So which ones then do not have one? Uh, I have a list. I, 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 I don't have it with me, but it's the schools that were built in the 70s and 80s, sir. Well, I only think of Benavides. Um, we can we can do we can talk about Flores Leo. Right. Uh, the, the, the but those, old, but those schools are in compliance. Yes, ma'am. With that's what, what I said. Quiet, based on ones? the year they were built. Exactly. Yes, ma'am. That's why I'm saying I'm asking because you said that they're in compliance, so I don't know. Yes. If we have older schools than that. Uh, there's it's only a few for, for the most part. Uh, um, I'd say about 80, 80 to 90 percent are, are were built after 1990. La Jolla High School has that was probably yeah. what 1991, yeah. and, and that one does have a, a, a riser room mm -hmm. sprinkler system. Uh, the next one on the list is visible FDC signs. We had these in our exterior uh, walls uh, where the fire department connects to to their water source in case of a fire. We just need to upgrade them and, and get new ones. They're kind of faded out. That's the one that was called out as well. Um, extension corps. Uh, and we're all guilty of this. Any type of appliance, is, if, a to if it's a toaster, a fridge, a microwave, they need to be connected directly to the outlet. Um, we found some schools where they were connected with a surge protector or a, or a extension cord, that's not allowed. So we're gonna tag it up on that as well. Uh, door stoppers. Let me show you an example of a door stopper, what they called us out in. So we have uh, fire doors throughout the, the district. Uh, depending on the campus and what the specs call for, some schools have more fire doors than others. Um, so when it's a fire door, you're not allowed to make any modifications to it. You can't put any paper on it. You can't put a door stopper. You can't put any type of closing device to prevent the door from, from closing. So this is an example of a, of a fire door with a door stopper. There we go. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. So that's a fire door. It has a door stopper. So luckily, like I said, we had crews of a physical plant uh, shadowing us. So anytime they would call us out for a door stopper, we were going out there and correcting that issue, that violation. So we were removing the door stopper. We were filling it in with fire caulking and fire foam and then, and then making sure it was flush with the door. So some teachers, when they return to their classroom, they're going to notice that I don't have a door stopper. It's not allowed. You have a fire door. It needs to be closed. Um, and, and those buildings that do have fire doors, that was the specification of that building? Yes, ma'am. Like I said, some schools have more fire doors than others just because that's, that's what the specs called for when, when the engineer uh, developed uh, those plans. Um, for example, Jimmy Carter, every single door of Jimmy Carter is a fire door. And some other campuses, maybe just the exterior are fire doors, maybe just the interior. It just depends on the layout of the campus. Um, ceiling tiles, that was another one. They, um, they came during the month of June when we're running wire, when we're running communication wire to connect uh, any IT stuff, to connect uh, HVAC controls. So let me show you an example of a violation of a ceiling tile. Something so simple like that, it's open just a little bit, that's a violation. So all we were doing is just poking the ceiling tile, it would get back into place, and we were good to go. And you'll see right now when I, talk, when I show you the reports that by law they have to report what they saw, but since our guys are fixing it, they're also adding on the report fixed during the inspection by Mr. Lloyd Loya or anyone who was out there. Uh, the next one is wall membrane penetrations. It sounds like a big word, but it's just basically a hole coming into our electrical room. And what I mean by that is throughout the years where we add outlets or we add appliances or, or different things to our campus, we have to run new wire into our electrical room and we need to cover up those, those penetrations. So there's an example of how we covered that up. You see the fire foam on top? So now we're in compliance. So we got caught out on it, but we fixed it. It's ready to go. I'll show you another one. Uh, this one's really neat. 
you can actually see where all the conduit pipe is coming in and now we're, we have it completely sealed off. So that's a correction. It's been corrected. Uh, the next one is stage curtains and window curtains. Uh, some of our uh, classrooms are situated where the sun is hitting them all day, so we understand that teachers want to put up curtains. If it's not a fire rated curtain, it can't be up. Uh, so what they're recommending is for us to purchase those metal blinds to, to be up there to take place for that. And of course our stage curtains, for example, some of our high schools have 15 curtains behind the, the, the original curtain. Those are not being utilized, so that's a big fire hazard, so we're uh, gonna take those down in the back, storm somewhere under under a porch a AC, uh, of course under AC to make sure that they don't deteriorate. And um, so that's a plan that, that we're gonna do throughout the year. We're gonna be going to campuses, removing the curtains that are not being utilized. Uh, the last one that I have is staff training. So they like that we have training on on fire extinguishers, training for our CNS staff that op that that use uh, uh, that. That grease fires can 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 uh, can um, per, can be produced right when they're cooking. So we do have those trainings, but they want us to add more trainings. For example, uh, the recommendation they gave us was when we uh, ha like a new hire initial training. I know part of our checklist is to go to Chronos, go to the insurance. They want us to add something where the employee will get trained on active shooter training, life safety training, uh, of course how to operate a, uh, a fire extinguisher. So those are the recommend, uh, recommendations that the uh, fire marshal gave us. Those were the, the top uh, violations that we got called out for. So I spoke about the checklist. I spoke about the evacuation diagram. If you have your booklets in front of you, or I can also put it here on the... We're going to get to the reports now. Um, I added one, middle, one uh, elementary, one middle school, and one high school to make the, the, the meeting a little more efficient. Um, let me talk a little bit about these inspections. So I'm, I'm gonna show you Tabasco Elementary. Um, Tabasco Elementary, you're gonna see three different reports. So for every building that's outside the main building, you need to have a report. La Jolla High School, we're gonna have about 27, 28 reports. Why? Because we have a main building, that's one report. Then we have 14 portables, so that's 14 reports. Then we have two vocational buildings. That's another two reports. We're up to 16 there. We have a field house. We have dugouts. We have uh, softball offices, softball uh, storages, uh, JROTC, a science building. So for every camp is different. It's different depending on, on uh, how many buildings they have there. So for example, Tabasco Elementary, this is the, the main building. We walked this one June 6th of 2022. Uh, like I said, we're going to be seeing the first one there is inspection occupancy. That's where we need to add the occupancy sign to our uh, gyms and, and uh, cafeterias, places of assembly. The next one is fire extinguisher annual inspection. It's present October 2021, so we have until October 22, October of 2022 to uh, go out there and, and, and change the tag and get it reinspected. So we're in compliance. The next one is our fire panel. We have until November of this year to get it reinspected. The next, so th these are not violations. These are just telling us that, that, that we're that we're doing good there and those aspects. The next one is uh, the suppression system in our kitchens. We're good until December of 2022. Next is just that that we have smoke alarms. They're present. Exit signage is present. These are the violations. So the first violation is method to ensure proper placement of appliances. What does that mean? That's inside our kitchens. Uh, so anything on casters, any equipment that's on wheels needs to be tethered down and they need to be in a certain location. So in case of a fire, the equipment does its job and sh shuts off the, the, the grease fire. So what they're recommending for us to do is paint like a line where the equipment needs to be. So if the employer is there and the equipment's Outside that line, they know they need to put it back. So it's just something very simple like that. And if you go to the next line, you'll see that it was corrected during the inspection by Mr. Felix Mercado, one of our uh, CNS employees. So that violation has been taken care of. You go to the next one, building electrical service. Uh, basically, we were missing a cover plate in one of our junction boxes, and that was corrected by Mr. Rick Leos, one of our electricians. 
So that, that violation has been taken care of. And for some reason, this mouse is not cooperating. Uh, the next one is breaker panels, un unused openings. So we have these huge panels in, in our electrical rooms and anytime we remove uh, a breaker, sometimes those, uh, there's an open section. So all we had to do was go back in there, put a stainless steel cover, and like it says here, it was corrected by Mr. Rick Leos. So that's been taken care of. The next one is um, the one I was talking about, our exit lighting. Uh, we are doing that, but now we need to provide documentation that, 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 that we're doing that on an annual basis, which we're gonna do this year. The next one is the evacuation diagrams. The, uh, if you look where it says notes, the you are here, north directional indicator. So we already spoke about that. Um, next one is membrane, uh, membrane penetrations. Those are the ones in the, in the, that we filled up with fire caulking. It's been corrected by Mr. Felix Mercado. The next one is fire door labels. So these fire doors, they have a label on them. That's, that's how you know they're a fire door. So when we hire people to come in the summer to help us out to paint, they don't know that they shouldn't paint over them, so they paint over them. So you can't see the, the tag is there. So what we're having our painters do right now is go out there with paint thinner just to erase the paint and now you can see the tag. So that's basically what we're taking care of and that's, that's being uh, addressed and, uh, as, as we speak. Um, again, you'll see that's another uh, occupant load site in the library. Next one is just that, that one of the electrical panels, it's missing the, the lock. Those have been ordered and those are gonna be replaced. Um, a big one that we have gotten together with Chief Gonzalez about is uh, this violation. It's uh, the daily required inspection checklist was not available at the time of inspection. It shall be the duty of principals, teachers, or staff to inspect all exit facilities daily to ensure that all stairways, doors, and other exits are properly in proper condition. So now they're going to require for us to have a log that at the end of the day, someone at that campus, either one of the officers, uh, one of the um, uh, officers that, that we hired to, to, to be at our campuses or a principal or an administrator, a custodian, will go around the, the campus at the end of the day to ensure that all the doors are closed, that all the doors are working properly. And we're gonna have a log for that, a daily log. Uh, next one is just a fire smoke damper inspection. I need to make contact with the manufacturer of our HVAC equipment and as, uh, they're gonna provide me with uh, documentation that their HVAC equipment has a fire damper, which they all do. So that will be uh, taken care of as well. So that's it for the main building. Then we'll go to the gym. Same thing for the gym. It needs an occupancy sign. It needs a annual um, fire marshal, uh, uh, I mean fire marshal, a fire extinguisher inspection. And we're good until October of, of, of this year. Um, same thing, emergency lighting, exit signage. Towards the bottom it says, fire alarm is past due for annual inspection. No inspection labels. We're not past due. All they want us to do is the tags that we have in the main building need to be at the sub panel in the gym. So it's, it's not a big deal. They're just gonna make copies of the, of the tags that are in the main panel and, 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 and staple them to the panel on the back and we're good to go. Uh, the next one is um, we need to la label where our fire alarm um, breakers are at. So each fire alarm has a breaker, and I can show you a picture of me, uh, pictures. So basically they want this. Excuse my handwriting, I don't have the best handwriting in the world, but it looks okay. Um, we need to identify where our fire breakers are at. So here I put fire alarm breaker located in cafeteria mechanical room, B103. It's in panel LB and breaker, breaker number 21. So in case a, a fire department gets there and they need to shut off the, the, the alarm system, they know when they get to the panel, it's in, it's in red marking, uh, the breaker's gonna be in the cafeteria, they get to the cafeteria, they get to the panel, and they know what breaker number. So I mean, it, it's, it's gonna make us a lot more efficient, a lot more organized. Um, mechanical rooms, we, I, I just, I, I wanna give thanks to our operations department from our transportation people who came in to help us uh, take all uh, the equipment that needed to go to the auction site, old furniture that was being stored in the mechanical rooms. We completely cleaned our, cleaned our mechanical rooms out. Let me show you a, a picture of how one of the mechanical rooms looked before. So we had some of the mechanical rooms that looked like this. 
right? These, uh, these items need to be sent to the, the to, to Bangor Group with Mr. Aimito. After we went in there and cleaned it out, no, that's not it. This is how our mechanical rooms look now. They're spotless, they're clean. So we, we're gonna expect our custodial department and our campuses to uh, keep our mechanical rooms like this. I'll show you a, a few other examples just so you kind of get a feeling for what we were doing this summer with our, so these are shoulder pads. After we went in there and, and helped the coaches clean that out, this is how, how it looks. Beautiful, I mean, we had zero violations on our mechanical rooms. Let me get back to the inspection. So we're done with the gym. The next one is a shed. So in each campus, we have a groundskeeper shed. It's a four by four, it's a five by five little sheds. By law, they need to have an occupancy sign in there. So we're gonna add an occupancy sticker on it. They need to have a fire extinguisher and they need to be inspected. So that's been taken care of already. So that's Tabasco. Uh, the next one on our list is the Zavala Middle School. That's a middle, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all the elementaries so we can be a little bit more efficient here. Um, we walked this one June 8th and the same thing. Uh, occupancy uh, signs, um, this one is, it's, it's, it's basically the same thing. Just taking us what, what we need to fix. Our fire, let me get to the violations on that. So violations on, on, on uh, sprinkler violations. FDC sign is not legible. That's, I spoke about that. We're gonna replace those with a brand new FDC sign. Um, this one is requiring a five year uh, inspection. So all our sprinkler systems get annually inspected, uh, but some are due for their five year. So we made contact with the, with the vendor. They're gonna come out here and, and take care of that for us. This is a, a sprinkler discussion rings. Our sprinkler heads, there's a, a little ring that goes around them. They just need to be tightened up. And I mean, I can go through this in, entire um, uh, report, but if we have any more questions, it's basically the same thing. They're all wearing tear, common wear and tear items that we're addressing. We're taking care of this. Um, we have, we've had countless meetings with our operations department, um, and we are gonna address this. Like I said, every month we're gonna send um, an update of what we're addressing until we're, we're done with, with all these findings. Do I have any questions or do you need me to continue with these reports? I'm not sure, Ms. Hernandez's question from the earlier was answered, but this was considered uh, by the state fire marshal as a consultant visit. Yes. And so because it was a consultation, they are not returning to inspect okay. that we do this. What they, what they do want is that on a monthly basis, we send them an update of what we had fixed. But so, their plan is not to return to reinspect. Yes, as of right now, no. So if you look at in every uh, inspection report, it says next inspection date, no inspection scheduled yet, and it's a consultation. And I, I think this is coming from us being so proactive. We saw all our other people behind them fixing every deficiency, so they know we're being proactive. They know that we're taking care of all this. So, uh, like I said, I mean, uh, at some point in time, they will come back, but we'll be ready. Let me ask you, when was the last time that we had, uh, I know you said local? Yes, ma'am. When was the last time that they were here? I took over this department in 2019, and 2019, for, since then, I've only had uh, local uh, fire marshals. I can't speak for the directors that were here before me who were in charge of the department. Yeah, but when but, was the last but time? But is it yearly? You know? Like, is it done yearly? Or? Yes, ma'am. Every year, by, by law, we're required to have a fire marshal inspection. So, uh, okay, um, I guess my... my one of my concerns is, and, and I do appreciate, you know, I know I have a building as well too and there are little things sometimes that it's like, yes, oh, you can fix on the spot and that's perfect. But for example, on, on a fire alarm past due for annual inspection, Which how report does that you happen? At? Like at Tabasco Elementary? Yes. Like past due on an annual inspection and maybe, I mean, maybe it's something small and I'm not reading it right. It says a fire alarm system is past due for annual inspection. Isn't that like a given, like just done automatically every year? Yes, yeah, so I, I spoke about that. So since there's three reports for Tabasco, there's a main, a gym. We have a main panel that communicates with the gym. The, we have a sub panel in the gym. So they want the same tags that are in the main panel to be added in the, in, in, in the sub panel at the gym. That's all that means. It's, I mean, it's annually inspected. 
So we have until November of this year to go out there and re-inspect it. All they're asking there is those tags that you have in, in your main panel that communicates with the sub panel in the gym, I need those tags back here as well. That's, that's all that means, man. So it was, so a, was, it it was marked, it was inspected yes. and it was marked in the main, in the main panel, but yes, not in the second one. Yes, and that's, that goes back to the, to the vendor. They, they should know that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, they're making their phone calls to the vendors and letting them know uh, that, that they need to fix those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like they have like also fire doors inspected annually. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's something new. It's a violation. Yeah, so that's something new that we're going to implement, uh, Dr. Cantu. Um, we need to have a, a, a log of all our fire doors around the entire district. So right now we actually have a database where we have all our fire extinguishers that you go and you scan them with a barcode and it update, it uploads to our database. So we're going to do the same thing with our, with our doors. That way, when they come back, or when, if somebody wants to know how many fire doors do you have at Jimmy Carter, would you log into our database? And I'll tell them they have 100 fire doors at this location, and they'll, they'll be numbered. So, Loya, was it, uh, yes, did they inspect other buildings besides the schools, or just schools? They concentrated in all our campuses, sir. But not, uh, let's say, the administration building? No, because those are inspected by our, our, our local uh, fire marshal, sir. And anybody inspect the Hope Academy? Our older facilities next those, door. Those have had inspections, and I've, I've submitted those to the principals. They, they, they have those, sir. So, but, I mean, they, the fire marshal did do those, that one? I need to check my list, but they checked all our campuses, sir, for the most part, yes. Okay. Yeah, because that would be one of the buildings that probably is, you know, Yes, like, like, for example, Kika, Kika uh, Elementary wasn't inspected because we, we closed that campus down. So they didn't go to Kika. They just, they went to where we're going to have instruction where kids are going to be uh, uh, showing up to every morning. And do we Staff have any students? students now at East Academy, what used to be the East Academy? No, no. we do not. Not at East, only West. At West, we do. Yes. So and everywhere we're not familiar students, now with we... the Head Starts, but do we have facilities with Head Starts? Yes, we have, well, we have Head Start classrooms at Seguin Elementary, and this year we'll have them at Fort Dice Elementary. But they're all part of the buildings that we're Yes. yes okay, so thank we're you. all inspected. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anything? I just want to uh, commend yes, you for your attitude. I think you had a really positive attitude, all of you, and I think that any time that someone from the outside gives us feedback, it's important, you yes, know, we learn from it. And so I want to commend you on your positive attitude about fixing all the things that needed to be fixed. And I want to thank the support services for being right behind you and yes, fixing the, the, the things. and. Um, I'm just really proud of you guys. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. Especially because I know that, like you said, when somebody else comes, everybody sees things with different eyes. And the more eyes we have, the better, right? Yeah. Because the more we correct. But, uh, you know, I want to commend you as well because it does, it, does, it does take that positive attitude to say, what do you need? I change it right now. What do we do? We're always trying to improve and, and better our, our, our campuses, right? So anything, any feedback we get is good. So, yes. again, thank you as well for, for this. Thank you so much. And I, I want to thank all our operations department, Mr. Rick Virreal, our, our boss, for giving us the, uh, the, the ability to, to, to run our department. And uh, Mr. Gonzalez from Transportation, taking over 30 bus drivers to help us clean out mechanical rooms. Uh, Mr. A.G. Chapa with Custodio and, and, uh, and CNS. I would call CNS. They would go out there and, and take care of any deficiencies. And of course, physical plant. Uh, Mr. Mr. Flores, Mr. Joe Real, Luigi Mendoza, uh, I mean, anything we needed, they were out there and they gave us all the help we needed. And my staff, my compliance and energy staff, I can't say enough about them. So thank you for, for hearing out. Uh, uh, thank you, man. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it was a team yeah, effort yeah. and yes. you all yes, did great. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Mr. Loya. And uh, uh, of course, to all the staff that you mentioned and yes, also our, our principals and our administrators and teachers at the, at the campuses also that, yes, that prepared the campus and did what we asked them to do so their schools would be ready. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, anything else other than adjournment? No? If not, I think we're ready to adjourn. This work session is adjourned at 740.